Gerlich. Wolfgang, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Oh, thanks for coming. I, uh, I understand you had a little bit of drama at your home recently. Yes, the uh, the excitement of the pandemic uh, has meant that we've all been much more flexible. And today, of all days, unexpected, unannounced, uh, my drywallers showed up. So <laughs> everything's torn up. Oh, uh, yeah. So you were doing it from your car, which is actually pretty good because I remember when you used to do screencasts about security from your car, sometimes yeah. while you were driving. Exactly. It's this is this is a callback to that. Right. And uh, okay. I had to stop doing those because I stopped driving. But you're you're right that the sometimes driving part is uh, where I got into trouble. I posted something to Reddit <laughs> and I was like, don't do that. It's you're putting us all at risk. <laughs> Uh, and you were all about risk mitigation because you're a security guy. Exactly. I think it, I think you should trust a security person who takes risks because you know that they know uh, you know how to handle it. I'm sure that's totally not a rationalization, but uh, the uh, I want to talk to you about. I'm looking at your blog right now, and you have a whole section on cyber security design principles um, divided up into subsections about vision and protecting organizations, security capabilities, architecture, controls, implementation. Um, there's, wow, 30 or 40 posts here, I think, uh, that, I mean, you're, you're putting a lot into this here. What's the, uh, what, what's, what exactly are you, is there an overarching theme of what you're writing about here? Yeah, in general, in in security and i think software development is has done a much better job at this right if you think about uh design principles they come from you know they trace all the way back to security architecture and street architecture and you know there's a lot of pulling from classic design thoughts into uh ui and ux whereas security we've always been like oh we're we're our own thing we know what we're doing it's all unique it's all special to us and the realization I had was there's so much that we can learn from the classic designers, from, mm -hmm. from you know, Dieter Rams, from, uh, you know, you just go down the line, uh, Eames. And so I started the series to pull out classic designers and to feature one of their designs or one of their ideas, and then tie that back to a principle related to designing in cybersecurity. Hmm. Well, give me an example. Actually, let's start uh, early on. Like, what's the first principle that I ought to be thinking about when I'm uh, designing security? You know, the the concept of empathy, of course, is one that we always think about. If you look at like IDEO and uh, some of the principles right. that they put together. IDEO is what? IDEO is a design firm, mm -hmm. and uh, and what was really fascinating about IDEO is. Uh, they were the ones who designed the original computer mouse. So we we think about uh, we think about Mac and the first computer mouse, and we think about uh, Steve Jobs. But if you trace it back, what happened was we had Doug Engelbart, and he came up with like the wooden mouse, and mm -hmm. his mental model was this was a like a musical instrument. So the first uh, iteration of the mouse, he had a six month he had a six month course he would put people through in order to drive this computer mouse. Now, the next iteration. But of course, was, to learn how to use the mouse? To use it, yeah, and how to drive the computer. Six months. Oh, wow. So the next iteration is, is Xerox, and they think of it as a computer, uh, as a precision engineering instrument. So they have this very thick manual. It's really fascinating, which was a service manual for the mouse. So they had a custom mouse made. It was much more what we would assume a mouse would look like today, a mechanical mouse at least. And they had a, a weekly uh, process where they would disassemble it and they would tune it up and they'd realign everything and they put it back together. So uh, in today's dollars, that mouse was around $2,000 per mouse with a weekly touch point of engineering, keeping it fit, right? So Steve Jobs comes up and he's like, look, we're, we're coming out with the, the new Apple. We need a computer mouse. Uh, I saw what Xerox is doing. It's cool. Uh, however, it can't be $2,000. Our entire price point is much lower than that. 
Uh, it can't take six months. As a matter of fact, some of the first uh, videos promoting it touts about, oh, someone can sit down and learn how to use a computer mouse in 16 minutes. And you're listening to that. But today's ears are like, 16 minutes, it's a weird number, right? How does he arrive yeah. at 16 minutes? But they went through a design process where they tried out a whole bunch of materials, did rapid iteration, a lot of things we think about today in terms of Scrum and Agile processes. And, and each time went back and said, is this right? How long does it take you to do this? What happens over time as these things wear? Do I need an engineer to maintain it? And they're able to get that price point down to uh, to about seventy dollars in today's money, and of course, according to Steve Jobs, <laughs> sixteen minutes to learn how to use it. Mm. And and I think about that oftentimes because when we go to design and build security, um, we look at things and we tend to over engineer it. Right? Oh, it's it's clearly going to take months to train people on how to follow the security practices. It's clearly going to take a significant amount of budget to implement all these controls. And, and I think if we look at that design methodology of starting with empathy, rapidly going through prototypes, tuning and tweaking, getting it more close to the way people work, we can come up with better security solutions. I think uh, I can relate to this because uh, I'm, I'm more of a software developer and the trap I fall into is thinking that my users think like me and, uh, and designing things that would be intuitive to me yes. and and that empathy it took me a while to, to to shift my mind around and say you know what these users don't care about you know, relational databases for example they don't care that uh this is a relational database and they have to delete the all the children before they delete the parent they just want to delete the thing you know that's that empathy thing crosses a lot of concerns and in the the fact is, is that a lot of innovations don't go anywhere because mm -hmm. we don't bring in the users in or people who think like the users, right? We won't bring the voice of the customers in. Um, one of the principles I wrote about that just shocked me um, was, uh, and I and I was writing this when the, the moon landing uh, anniversary rolled around, right? We, we landed mm -hmm. on the moon and it was an entire two more decades before someone thought, you know, we should have suitcases in the airports with wheels. Carrying them around doesn't make sense. <laughs> and, and like, how, how, what was behind that? And when I dug into it, it was a, a gentleman named Plath who uh, was a pilot and an inventor. And he tinkered in his home and he came up with a design and he knew what worked and what didn't. And he knew how it needed to fit on the plane and go over the ramp and everything. And uh, because he was the insider, because he was thinking as a, the customer, he was able to come up with a design that took off. And of course, you know, we all use it today when we get to fly. Uh, previously, people thought, oh, I'll put wheels on a suitcase. I actually have one of the original wheeled suitcases that no one bought, no one <laughs> used. It didn't go anywhere. There's a patent uh, from, I think, the, the early 70s. And, uh, and they didn't work because they weren't really designed for how people travel. Hmm. Well, how does this relate to security, though? Well, it relates to security. I'll give you a great example. With, with that insight, I was working with an organization that was doing privileged access management. And so they had this really complicated, convoluted privileged access management. We had to jump from this box to that box, and then you had to change passwords and click on this portal, and do this other thing. So imagine if you're trying to push code to production, or imagine if something is broke. Imagine if your SR team, SRE team is screaming, hey, fix this. You got like 18 steps before you can even execute anything out of the command line. And uh, and what we did was we brought in place some engineers. We brought in place some of the, the DevOps folks and the IT folks, and we looked at what they're doing in their workflow. And we redesigned that privilege access management solution so that it worked the way they worked. Fewer steps, easier to use. And then the kicker was, and I thought this part was really cool, um, we also tried to figure out what would make it more attractive, and we ended up with this gaming laptop with like the, the like glowing colors and all sorts of craziness. Mm -hmm. This gaming laptop that the admins could take home, which was a privileged access workstation. It had all the tools, significantly fewer steps, worked like you know you would expect if you're a pilot dragging on a suitcase, if you're an admin dragging your, your privileged access workstation, you know what you need. 
And so by bringing that voice of the customer in, you can create much better security solutions. Hmm. I'm looking at one of your posts here. It says, uh, dare to be ugly. It's about prioritization, but I was, I'm curious, what do you mean by that? So uh, dare to be ugly. Yeah, that's that's another one of my favorite ones. Um, in and I was talking uh, on uh, on Facebook with a good friend of mine who's a uh, CISO for a healthcare org, and we were arguing about how how complex or simplified you should have things to you know before you move ahead. He's like, no, the problem is uh, a lot of engineers, a lot of security folks will way overcomplicate it, and we'll get deeper and deeper, and we'll pull down you know the the original specs, and we'll. We'll pull down a whole bunch of different software. We'll write our own code and we'll keep digging deeper and deeper until we reach the molten core of the earth. And then <laughs> we'll reemerge and go, here is the exact perfect solution. And by that point in time, you know, months to years have passed. <laughs> the business has changed. What the customer wants has is, is changed and not been, been invoked. Uh, when I think about dare to be ugly, I think about in the software development world, the difference between waterfall and, and agile. And okay. a lot of security programs are run waterfall. We come up with these perfect specs. We try to make them ideal. We spend way too much time on it. When we just had a bunch of ugly iterations, we could get closer and closer to what really was driving secure behaviors. Uh, so this is this one of those things that perfect is the enemy of good. If you if you don't ship anything, if you spend all your time achieving perfection, then uh, you may never get there. Whereas a good enough solution will. Um, will solve the problem and if it's and you can then improve it over time. Absolutely. Uh, well said. I think related to that is uh, you have another post here called minimum viable security. And of course, <clears throat> in the startup world, minimum viable product is a common term. It's that thing that can go to market uh, with just the features that are necessary, not all the bells and whistles. You're applying that to security as well. Yeah, the the concept of dare to be ugly is for a security professional to be okay with the first early iterations uh, and not over optimize, right? To be okay with what it looks like and what risk we're reducing and then slowly step towards a better future. And uh, minimum viable is, is the feature side of that. <laughs> the dare to be ugly is, can I emotionally let go of my idea of perfection? And minimum right. viable, much like minimal viable product, is what are the exact controls we need to hit? And I think when when we look at security um, from a black or white lens, we oftentimes tend to overcomplicate those specs. Your example, delete is is a good one, right? The the security control might be like, "Thou shalt delete data after the transaction." Well, you can spend a lot of time and go, "Okay, I'm going to delete the data," but wait a minute, it's still in memory, so I'm going to purge memory from the system. All right, wait a minute, what if what about things that were written in disk? Well, I'm also going to like go and I'm going to degauss those disks with a magnet. Well, wait a minute, we got some things in the cloud. We can't degauss the cloud. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go one, you know, <laughs> you can really over-engineer for any requirement. And I think in, in security, we, we oftentimes do that because security professionals are so passionate about getting it right, uh, we, we make it way too complex. The example I, I believe I used for that one was uh, Mark Tilden, who was a roboticist and a friend of mine out of Canada. And at the time, robots were these big, shaky, heavy things, right? We're talking like the 80s. And the idea of like walking robots was almost impossible. MIT came out with their Attila robots, which were uh, Rodney Brooks. They could walk, they could, you know, move. Uh, but again, you're, we're talking like the price of a car. And Mark mm -hmm. Tilden looked at the problem and went, you know, I could solve that with a busted uh, Walkman and, and a coat hanger. And people were like, <laughs> what? It's and like a MacGyver thing. <laughs> exactly. It was just like a MacGyver thing. And he came up with this type of robot that I, I built a few of myself um, that you can build for, you know, a hundred bucks with some recycled parts that could walk and run and scurry. And it really revolutionized what the feature set of a walking robot was. You no longer had to compute every single step. You just built it and it walked and it ran and started to fall and it catched itself and it uses physics and momentum to keep going. And uh, I think about that a lot in security, right? We can really over-engineer and have the perfect solution. Uh, but if we have the minimum specs and can meet those in a way that's empathetic, we've got a much better chance of succeeding. 
Very cool. I'm a, there's another one here that's similar to that. Build Roombas, not Rosie's. Rosie, of course, was the Jets all-purpose AI housekeeper that did everything, whereas a Roomba is a single-purpose thing. It just vacuums. And you're, picking up on, you're picking up on my theme of simplicity here. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm, simple. I'm a fan of simplicity myself. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit here. Um, you've got one here called Tell a Story with the Project Name. Why, why is the project name even important? Yeah, I, um, I love that particular story because it's uh it's based on uh santiago and in santiago city the, the, the city, city of santiago the city of santiago and the um the a number of the buildings were written by a poet or named by a poet so he was brought in to come up with very poetic very creative names that would help sell the project help you know get people to move into the buildings and uh and in effect when you think about it that means the the city itself is his largest written body of work. And to me, that just really spoke to me. When I, I think back to some of the security programs that have been successful to me, if I name it like, this is the Beyond Trust uh, product, or this is the um, you know Zero Trust uh, Vendor X product, it, it doesn't go very well. It doesn't tell a story. It doesn't really tell what you're trying to achieve. If you think about naming projects in a way that uh, excites people and that is explicit, um, you have much more success. So maybe the um, remote enablement project, that doesn't sound very poetic. I'm not a poet, <laughs> but maybe I had one that was, uh, I think back when you and I first met, I was running a project called Outsource Boring, where I was okay. challenging my team to take everything they didn't like and we find partners so we could reduce that amount of work and focus on the areas we're passionate about and added value. Now, outsource boring sounds much better than the vendor assessment and review process. <laughs> it's, it's being creative so that you can get buy and support. I think my company needs to hire more poets because I work for a company that does a lot of things really well, but naming products is not one of them. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> yes. Um, and then uh, let's see, we're, uh, we've got time for a couple more here. Um, you have one about luck, the importance of luck. What's uh, what's up with that? Yeah, there there's a pastry, a very famous pastry uh, that was invented because the pastry chef was rushing out the door uh, and there was a you know, food critic, a very influential food critic. And in rushing, he dropped the pastry, shattered the plate, <laughs> broke the pastry. And the, the head chef looked at that and went, that's really clever. I liked how it broke and it splattered. I like the pattern. <laughs> and they recreated that on a real plate and gave that <clears throat> to the critic. And it's now one of their most famous uh, dishes. Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, so uh, relate that to security. Sure. Uh, when when we're working in security, a lot of things are happening. And oftentimes, if we're not open to thinking about how these things can connect to what we're trying to achieve, we can miss a lot of opportunities. So, for example, uh, I know a gentleman who was working on a software development security program, and uh, his team moved to GitHub. And that meant nothing to him. Uh, he didn't know what GitHub was, but he knew, hey, something just happened. The plate just dropped. What does that mean? And he went and sat down with the, the lead again, engaging the, the folks who are doing it. And the lead's like, yeah, I think GitHub has some security stuff. You should talk to this other person. So I went to talk to a GitHub expert. And sure enough, a good quarter of the controls that he was thinking he was going to have to buy or build or enforce were already within the product. And now did he did he champion moving to GitHub? No. Was it? Was it even on his roadmap? No, didn't even know what GitHub was at the beginning of this. No, but he was prepared to get lucky and when something changed because he was listening and thinking about, you know, what new possibilities this open up. He was able to jump in and really reap a lot of benefits uh, mm -hmm. for a secure code project without having to spend a dime <laughs> or asking the developers to do something different. I want to talk about one more here because I really like the title of it is uh, Make Security an Inside Job. What do you mean by that? Yeah, and uh, and I already touched on this. A lot of that comes with the story of Robert Plath and his suitcase. But fundamentally, 
we need better security advocates and security champions. And in my way of thinking, a security champion is someone within the business function who cares about security and, and wants to advocate for it and participate. And security advocates are someone within the security org who wants to help that business unit achieve what they're going to do. And back to the software development example, our champion is the guy who said, hey, um, you know, we've got GitHub. This may help you. And our advocate is the guy who's like, ah, I'm working with the developers to build out a, a secure dev program. In, in my own world, uh, back in financial services, I had an advocate who was on the operations side, uh, who was always like, hey, we're doing this. What does this mean? Hey, we're doing this. Can we use this? Uh, and I was always advocating for her internally to be like, you know, we, we're asking for this much, but maybe we could do it fewer steps, easier, simpler. So when I think about making security inside job, what I want to do is I want to have that advocate and champion A in place and B working together to figure out ways that we can simplify what we're doing. Again, a common theme for me, right? Simplify what we're doing uh, with fewer steps, less decision points uh, to make security practical. I know we've only touched on uh, a fraction of the posts that you've written so far. Are there any that you want to call out that we haven't brought up before we close? Uh, Enzo Mori is is one that I do want to call up. He's an Italian designer, and this post isn't up yet. I should mention that my goal is to write 100 different principles from famous designers. Oh, I don't know how many you have here, but it's uh, you're on your way. You're, uh, I think, almost halfway there. I, I'm about halfway there. And so I release one every every Monday. And uh, what was fantastic about Enzo Mori, a number of things were fantastic. Unfortunately, we recently lost him. He, he died from from COVID. And cool. uh, his his entire body of work was given to the city of Milan with the caveat that it wouldn't be displayed for 40 years after his death. So <laughs> right now is in April uh, until April. Uh, in Milan is the last exhibit of his work. And I'm dying because I can't get to see it. Yeah. But Enzo Mori did something that I've never seen any other designer do. And he designed his furniture, his products, so that the people building them would A, enjoy the process, and B, would learn and grow from the process. So to put that differently, his designs are focused not on the end customer, but the person who's actually assembling them. And how can you make that person's lives better? And how can you leave them in a better place after they've interacted and built your product? And, uh, and I think that's such a powerful thought. How can we build our software tools, our security tools, so that the people who are interacting and assembling them and working on it leave uh, in a slightly better place, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna solve all problems that with that, um, but I think we can solve a few, and I think we can make a step forward uh, in the lives of of all us technologists. And so he he was very impactful when I was reading his work. Uh, excellent. I see, I see the common themes of uh, simplicity and listening to your users, uh, thinking like your users among a lot of these which I, I'm guessing is a common theme among designers. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I've learned a thing or two today, and uh, you stay safe. Thanks so much. Have a good one. When, uh, when the world shut down, I was in Europe and we flew home March 13th, two hours, two hours before the travel ban came into effect. And that meant I didn't see my friends anymore, right? Everything was just stopped. And uh, a, a good friend of mine was like, you know, you're, you're going to need a, a project. And I, yeah, I need lots of things. I need to get out. I need to go back to building tech. He goes, no, you, you need a project. And, and that's why I started doing this blog series, because it gave me an opportunity to explore technology uh, not just, you know, the latest security thing, but what did technology mean in the 1920s when it was a radio? What did technology mean in the 1950s when we were revolutionizing uh, sewing machines? What did it mean in the 90s when, when the iMac came out and just 
blew my mind that a computer could look that way. And uh, it's been so much fun because I get to reach out, I get to talk to, you know, friends like you, I get to reach out to other folks. I've interviewed some designers uh, and it's, uh, it's been my way of surviving what yeah. we're all going through. 